Okay, good morning. And thanks everyone for coming this morning. Today's the exciting conclusion to a series of seven talks on the five wisdom energies, which correspond to the five Buddha families. So during this talk today, I'll do a recap of the energies so that we have some memory of, of them, and then we'll explore ways in which to work with them and how this system of, um, of knowledge around um, different ways that we can be and, and different a um, accesses to energy that we have can be useful. And then I'd love to hear a little bit from everybody at the end, like what, how you relate to these energies, what you've learned about yourself, um, uh, if, any, if anything. So we have, uh, starting with Buddha energy. So Buddha energy is white and it's bare non-conceptualizing awareness. That's the wisdom of it. The element is space and the poison is ignorance. The wisdom is spaciousness, calming, it's approachable, it's light, soft, and undisturbed. The confusion, when it shows up as confusion, it's spaced out, dull, ignorant, stubborn, slow, unaffected, uncaring, avoidant, lazy, and unmotivated. And then Vajra, Vajra is blue, and it's mirror-like wisdom. The element is water, and uh, often folks can get confused about the water as the element, um, thinking about the water flowing, which I'm sure could be used in that way, but I think originally it's meant to be like the reflective aspect of water. Um, so if you imagine there was a time where mirrors didn't exist and the, the way to see oneself was actually to look in the water and to get clarity. So, so that mirror-like wisdom of, of the reflection of water. The poison is anger. The wisdom of Vajra energy is that it's focused, sharp, has a clear view. You know, if you think of right view in the Noble Eightfold Path, um, that there's a clarity of view. It's non-judgmental articulate and well-spoken, it's refined, crisp, fresh, and knowing. The confusion is, is that it can be critical, heady and too analytical, obsessive, easily frustrated, stuck in rules and systems, and needing to be right. And then rotten energy, rotten is the yellow. Its wisdom is, is equanimity or equality. The element is earth. The poison is pride and stinginess or miserliness. The wisdom is abundance, welcoming, accommodating, caring for the whole, providing, grounded, earthy, rich and grateful. Its confusion is that there's never enough. It's empty, but not like the spiritual, you know, the positive side of empty, sort of that black hole, that black and gape, that gaping black hole in one's belly or one's solar plexus. Uh, arrogant, grandiose, takes up more than its share of the space. Uh, there can be a poverty mentality and hoarding. And then Padma energy. Padma is red and the wisdom is the discriminating awareness. The element is fire. The poison is desire and lust. The wisdom um, is compassion, empathy, caring, bonding and binding, understanding, connection, intimacy, merging, 
emotionally available and passionate. The confusion is codependent, dramatic, over-emotional, easily hurt, fear of abandonment and rejection, and emotionally enmeshed with others. You know, not knowing, enmeshment means not knowing where you end and the next person begins and being overly, um, uh, overly um, caught up in someone else's emotional state and not knowing that it's theirs and what's yours. And then finally, karma energy. So karma is green and the wisdom is all accomplishing wisdom or all accomplishing um, awareness. The element is air or wind. You could think of like a fresh wind. The poison is jealousy and fear. The wisdom is that it's energetic. It gets things done. It's enthusiastic, influential, efficient, driven, industrious, productive, and pragmatic. The confusion is that it can be anxious, controlling, has a difficulty slowing down. It's emotionally unavailable, frantic, hasty, and driven to overcompensate for insecurities. Now, um, Roshi Shinko brought it to my attention that in the platform sutra, uh, that the four, four of these five wisdoms are talked about, and I'm sure they're found in other places as well. Um, and so the, not the Buddha energy, but the other ones are here. So I just wanted to read a short piece. So the platform sutra was written by Hui Ning, who is the sixth ancestor. And if you remember, Hui Ning was the, the lay, the lay practitioner who, um, you know, wrote the poem on the wall, um, and then, you know, had to leave the monastery, uh, to avoid the, the envy and jealousy of the other, of the other monks. So there's whole, there's this whole section here on what are called the three bodies and the four um, the th let's see the three bodies and the four kinds of knowledge. So here the four kinds of knowledge are these four wisdoms. Perfect mirror knowledge is your nature purified. So that's the the mirror like wisdom of Vajra. Universal knowledge is the mind with no defects. So the universal is probably Ratna, um, the equanimity. Um, but it could be Buddha energy, could be a mix of the two, but it's probably speaking to Ratna. Um, all penetrating knowledge sees without effort. So this one is um, likely the discriminating wisdom, the discriminating awareness of Padma. And then all succeeding knowledge is like the ground, the great round mirror. So it talks about the mirror here, but the all succeeding, um, as you read down through this a little further, it talks, it's kind of more like the all accomplishing um, wisdom of, uh, of action. So anyway, I'm, I'm not a master of this stuff, so I could have gotten some of that wrong, but um, they do, they're talking about the same thing. So it shows up here. In, in Zen, or actually Chan Buddhism, um, and back in the 7th and 8th centuries. So, pretty interesting. So, I just want to sit with these wisdoms for a moment, because I haven't really dove into those much in the previous talks. So, with Buddha energy, we have the non-conceptualizing awareness. So, you know, our behavior, you know, because a lot of these energies, I'm talking about the behaviors of them and how they show up in our lives and all that. Um, and, and we'll definitely get into that today. But for a moment, let's step out of this, of the, the body aspect and really right into the big mind, the big mind aspect or the big heart aspect of these energies. So non-conceptualizing awareness and space. So yeah, see if you can touch into that space, 
how spacious mind can be. And in that spacious, it's not a nothingness, it's not a voidness, but there's also nothing and there's void. But not void in some kind of negative way, it's like there's just no difference between anything. Everything washes into the whiteness. And that and oneness, it's like this purity of oneness. For me, I can really get in touch to that, in touch with that through the crown chakra, through the top of my my head, but also kind of through my heart and belly as well, and just feeling this expansion. And in each of these, in the awareness and the wisdom of each of these, they're all expanded. There's a feeling of expansion in all of them. And it's when they become confused, that's when the, the constriction happens. And that's more of a constricted feeling. So learning on the cushion, we learn to, it's like we're training our minds to have a more consistent awareness of the state of our bodies and minds. So during the day, we become more and more aware of when there's an experience of expansion and when there's an experience of contraction, even in just little moments. You know, for me, if I if I just had some kind of moment with a coworker <clears throat> or my partner or my son or, you know, uh, someone driving on the road, immediately after, I know something went wrong there because there's this feeling of contraction, of tightness in my body that expansion, that expansiveness has been lost. And there's a feeling difference and it doesn't feel good. So suddenly I'm not feeling good. I check in and it's like, oh, something is tightened. Ah, it was that interaction I just had a moment ago or an hour ago. Huh, okay. And then I check in further and often there's some kind of action that needs to happen. Sometimes I just, the action is just to sit and feel and process, let that energy move. And sometimes I need to go apologize or make, you know, make some kind of amends. So Vajra energy, the mirror-like wisdom. So yeah, imagine the awareness of this just massive mirror or a, a very, very still, clear lake. And just reflecting everything without any kind of um, disturbance or shift in the reflection. So it's an absolutely pure reflection of what's being seen, felt, heard with, yeah, with no misperception, with no goggles of ignorance or delusion, um, warping that reflection. And we have those experience sometimes, you know, when we see something, when we are looking and every just everything seems to have a twinkle to it. And it's just everything is has this brightness to it. And, and, and there's a sharpness. It's almost like, wow, am I wearing glasses? You know, like things get this really sharp um, perception and hearing. It's not just seeing, like hearing, smelling. When our minds are really clear, and there's nothing disturbing our hearts. So then, um, Ratna, the wisdom of equanimity or equality. And so here, this wisdom is expansive. And but it's not like Buddha energy. And Buddha energy, everything just dissolves into one. There's no distinction, but here there's distinction and things are coming and going and, you know, there's storms that move through and you get, you hear some, some, net, you know, some news on CPR or NPR that's disturbing or someone criticizes you. And all of that stuff is, you know, it just washes up on the shore. It's there for a moment, and then the wave washes right back out. And the beach is undisturbed. 
or it might be disturbed, but it's also undisturbed at the same time. And then Padma. Here we have discriminating wisdom. So again, an expansion, a feeling of expansion. And unlike Ratna, in Ratna, there's, or in, um, you know, in, in Vajra and Ratna, you see the distinctions. In this one, you see distinctions. Um, and there's a wisdom that goes along with what to let in and what to let out. Uh, but it's not a it's not a an aversion or a clinging. It's a wisdom of knowing what is what is what is right, what needs to happen right now in this particular situ situation. So there's an intimacy with the situation that's so clear. And then in karma energy, the all accomplishing wisdom. So again, there's distinction. Distinction is, is perceived. And in that distinction, um, this is less about the intimacy and more about action and energy and what needs to happen. And so being able, it's that, it's that um, you know, what we talk about, actually a lot of our koan practice has a karma energy in its answer of, you know, the, the koan is pointing to something and there's some kind of action that needs to happen to fully express um, the wisdom of that particular koan. And the koan in our life, in the moment, is do I need to turn left or right? <laughs> do, um, you know, do I need to fly home and be with my mom while she's sick. Yeah, all these things that ask of us to act in our life. So in each of those two, the element has its has its has its wisdom and its um and its um and it's a way that it can be harmful. So with space, with Buddha, space can be so wise in that um, it's the one taste, it's the single taste that everybody's accepted, everybody's in. There's nobody that's out, no enemies. Um, but there can also be, space can also um, be consuming in its own way. You can get lost, lost in the oneness. With the mirror-like wisdom of water, um, that mirror can be so incredibly useful. It can also be really intimidating for others. If we're just sitting there as a clear reflection for someone without any heart, without any softness to it, um, we can reflect way too much and a lot of people suffer. You know, we all have insecurities and we all have, um, you know, things about ourselves that we don't necessarily want to see really clearly sometimes. Um, and, you know, our teachers are very skillful in their, in their patience and showing and being reflections for us over long periods of time. They show little bits of of reflection, little bits of reflection. And then as our practice gets more and more seasoned and more and more mature, they hold that mirror up a little, a little um, more clearly. But as we wander through our lives, and especially with our families, um, especially as practitioners, as we develop awareness and wisdom, and then we spend time with our families who aren't necessarily doing that, um, we have to we have to be that hazy moon. We have to to um, uh, uh, 
damp dampen is that the right word dampen our light a little and then with the earth the earth can both provide and it can consume um, the earth can take us in it can destroy and it can also create so that's the ratna and then in padma this is probably my favorite metaphor of all of them is that fire you know that passion of that fire of passion you know fire can take two things two metal things and melt them into one that merging that bonding of love and that fire can also just consume and destroy and it can it can become um with karma added to it so some wind added to fire that fire can just rage through an entire room of people or through a relationship or through a family and just destroy and then finally karma the wind the fresh wind um you know wind takes seeds and spreads and creates life and direction and creates diversity with pollination and and life with pollination um and wind can also be so chaotic it can uh if you've ever stood in a strong wind you can actually get um a vertigo it can throw off your your um perception of things and you can have vertigo so it can really create confusion for us okay so i want to move on to um, how all these energies can support our practice so in recognizing our mix of energies including our predominant um, our predominant energies as well as our functional ones um, we can ask the question did i choose this did I choose to be this way? So, you know, did I choose to be a karma Vajra or did I choose to be a Padma Ratna? Of course not. We didn't have choice in that. Um, right there, we have a chance to realize that something is going on much larger than we can understand. As ignorant beings with egos and delusional beliefs in ourselves as separate and solid, it's almost like at birth we jumped in a raft with no paddle and have been running down this super intense river with all kinds of rapids and swirls and eddies and flat spots, bumping into other rafts, passing some, getting passed by others, the whole time saying, oh yeah, did you see how well I ran that rapid right there? Or the opposite. Oh my God, I'm so terrible. Do you see how poorly I did that river? It's all my fault. We egocentrically respond to our lives as if there is a me that is in control. In the first three steps of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, they go like this. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And the third is we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. Another way to see these three initial steps of AA, and I, and I want to say they are profound. Those three steps of AA are profound. And when I worked in residential addiction treatment for 30 days, that's what we focused on. We didn't go to the other 12 steps for 30 days we worked on those three steps of the 12 steps and they're the gate you know they are the gateless gate they are the gate into the spiritual journey so another way we can relate to these um and in a way that sheds light on them being essential parts of all spiritual paths if we want to have any progress in our path so you could, the first one goes, could go like this. We realized that we were powerless to our ego defenses, our clinging, our aversion, and our ignorance, and that our lives had become unsatisfactory and our minds and bodies out of control. And then the second one, we came to believe in a power much greater than our ego-driven agendas 
and that this power could somehow restore us to sanity. And then the third, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of the three treasures as we understand them. So our, our spiritual journey is an unending path of surrender. And like Rosh, um, like Shishin Roshi says so many times, you know, um, he reminds us that the Buddha said that it, it wasn't this path of gaining, it was this path of subtracting, not adding, but subtracting, of letting go of this and letting go of that, surrendering over and over and over again. In the 10 ox herding pictures, the ox herder wrestles with the ox after finally finding it. And by the sixth picture, the ox herder comes to harmony with the ox. The ox can be seen in different ways, but most commonly the ox is um, seen as uh, true nature. And so what is, what is true nature? What is our true nature? Is it just this? Or um, as uh, Schoen reminded us during his talk this past year, only just this? And so what is just this? So when we see, we see. When we hear, we hear. When we smell, we smell. When we taste, we taste. When we feel, we feel. And we think, there's just thinking. So in this raft, you know, here we are in this raft going through life. And at moments we can step out and watch. We can enter that spacious wisdom and just notice We can see what's coming ahead. We can see what's been behind. We can see where we are now. And we can see the dramas that we get caught up in. We can see that there's a personality that we might get attached to or some way of being that we'd rather be than what we are. We can get some, some perspective on all those stories. And so that's kind of more of a mindfulness approach you know, where we step out and, and look from distance, standing on the riverbank, watching the raft go down. And then there's the other practice of absorption, where we're still that person in the raft. We are the raft, we are the river, and we just experience it all directly. Experience the, the Tao directly, the way, the flow. From my experience, the more I surrender, and I'm sure that you all can relate, the more that I surrender, there's this fear of surrender because you feel like you're going to lose your power, or I feel like I, ha I have definitely had that feeling. Like I'll lose my power, I'll lose my, my identity, um, that I'll sink into some kind of void and just become nothingness. Um, but what I find actually is that there's more life, there's more power, there's more control. Like there's a control that comes from giving up control. And that that wisdom, that discriminating wisdom has more clarity about the, the cause and effect, the unfolding of karma. Because there's a willingness to see how things flow. You know, when we have that mirror-like wisdom and we can really perceive accurately, more accurately, um, then the future is, is not so mysterious. Neither, was the, neither is the past. Mysterious in one way, but, but also kind of like obvious in another way. Okay, so working with energies, I want to talk about energy shifting a little bit. So one way that I just talked about in working with the energies is that it gives us an opportunity to realize that there's something much greater than ourselves. That I didn't choose to be a Vajra Karma. And I can rest in that. I can let go. I can accept myself for who I am, for what this life is, for what the world is. Another is this energy shifting. So as we become more aware of our habitual ways of attending to situations in our lives, we develop more opportunities for choice. 
um, when we might have responded to a distressed friend in the past with karma energy of doing, like maybe our go-to is like, oh, I got to do something. You know, somebody's crying, I got to do something. Or with our Vajra energy, somebody's crying, okay, what's going on for you? Let's try to figure out what's going on for you. You know, and approaching from a conceptual place. You know, maybe we might be able to pause and, and, and find that Padma energy, that Padma wisdom, and relax and listen, and then wrap ourselves around that person like a warm blanket with compassion and care and love. Or when we might have been fired up by our Padma hurt and our Vajra criticism because we got some feedback from a supervisor or somebody in our life, we might be able to find that Buddha space, that Buddha energy and sink into that space or the equanimity and allow those emotions, the rotten equanimity and allow those emotions to come up on the shore and flow away and process and do what they need to do for some moment of time or period of time and then, and then move on. And that's kind of in the, uh, the next, the next way to work with these energies, which I've talked a lot about in the other talks is the transforming, um, which is to actually feel directly what's happening. So in that tension, you know, like I said earlier, you know, as we, as our practice develops, we develop this ongoing internal awareness that we have much more access to more readily and more consistently. And we, we're aware when we tighten because expansion becomes our norm versus the tension be, being our norm. When we show up to practice, the tension is the norm and that's our homeostasis and that's our status quo and that's what we're familiar with. But as we practice more and more, it's the expansion, the space that actually becomes the norm. So then it becomes very apparent when we tighten. And so when we tighten, say for example, in the miserliness of Ratna energy, um, wanting to hold and grab and not share. We can feel that. And my experience is that, is that whenever I f go right into that feeling, it's the opposite that actually then happens. When that tension expands, suddenly I feel generous. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 here you go. Sorry, I was being a, I was being a little ridiculous there for a moment. Here, please take it, please. So then I also want to talk about strengthening energies. So strengthening energies means that it's kind of like if you have a strength of, uh, you know, maybe your strength is your communication skills, then you might go take more classes on communication um, and even further develop that, that skill. So that's, that's what that means with these, with energies is that if you're a, a, a Padma, then even dive in more, you know, learn more about loving and caring and compassion and do more compassion practices. Explore the energy, like really get in there and, and, and really learn it more. And the more that we understand it and feel it and experience it in the expansive way, the more then they, we realize when it's tightening. And so we take those strengths or those kind of primary ways that we already are and just become very intimate. We use the Padma energy to become intimate with it. So I can use my Padma intention and my Vajra clarity to get to know my Buddha space a little more and really know that Buddha energy. And then we start to see more and more clearly where it's showing up as ignorance and avoidance. And then balancing energies so in the balancing, kind of like I just said, um, it's kind of a, an example for both, is that if I'm more of sort of a spaced out Buddha, then I'm going to try to get in touch with the Vajra energy more um, or the karma energy to get my butt off the couch and get, and get myself doing things. Or if I'm too karma, 
then I use, spend more time developing Buddha energy through meditation, through taking hot baths, through slow walking meditation, and really work um, in sort of a direct, in, in an opposite way from my, from my natural energies. And my experience has been that long-term, like, you know, um, the more I practice um, and the more I've learned about these energies, um, that I find that I am becoming more balanced in, in the energies than what I had originally sort of diagnosed myself as. And I think if we look around, probably like the people that we, that seem to be like the real special people in the world, you know, the Jack Cornfields and the, um, uh, the people throughout history, you know, who, who really seem to leave an impression. I think if we look at them, they often have a lot of balance of the energies. They might still have some, you know, their primaries might show up, but they tend to be people who, who have this, like really well-rounded balance of the energies. Or at least that's what I'm noticing when I look at them. So I've already kind of talked about the finding of um, compassion for oneself. Um, and sort of noticing like, okay, these are my energies, didn't ask for them, this is what I got. And we can do that with kind of any of our sort of personality traits or, you know, anything about ourselves or anything about the world, really. Um, and that can be really relieving, actually, if we can let go of the sort of change myself agenda. And I'm, I'm not cool with me, so I need to change me agenda. Um, there can be a lot of relaxation in that. then we can do that with others. And maybe some people might have easier time doing that with others first and then for themselves or for themselves and then others. It depends on the person. But I know that for me, it's really helped with my being around my family, uh, being around other people. You know, I think we all have this experience of, especially when people are very different types of personalities or different energies, than we are, it's really hard to understand why they're doing what they do. You know, someone who's very heart centered and emotionally aware and loving and compassionate and merging, they don't understand the more analytical people and why that person would rather go be alone at times and spend time alone and you know, spend time in front of the computer, you know, doing things rather than like hanging out with them. Like if they're in a relationship, for example, they might have a really hard time understanding that and vice versa, you know, someone who's more cognitively based um, and, and, and kind of more practical and more linear in their thinking and their decision-making, they don't understand why their partner or their friend or their boss, um, makes decisions in the way they do, you know, which might appear very impulsively and like very willing to make mistakes and making lots of mistakes to finally get the, get the decision right versus just making the right decision the first, the first go around. So we can give other people in our lives some space to be themselves. Um, one more thing, and then we'll get to our conclusion here. This is just an interesting thing. I think people tend to find this quite interesting. Um, and, and this is something I've come up with my, in myself. I haven't found this written anywhere, but I noticed this when I was working in residential, ad, ad, residential addiction treatment, and I would actually teach the Buddha, fam, the, the Buddha families to the residents there um, and talk about that as sort of a way to understand themselves better. And, um, so what, what I learned was that certain drugs and addictions that we're attracted to, we might be attracted to them because they do balance our energies or they enhance our energies 
or it's a way to indulge a certain energy. So, for example, Buddha energy. What drug do people use to get that Buddha space, to get that oneness, to get that relaxed, checked out space? Marijuana, right? Um, another thing that people do is television. When you sit in front of the TV, you can kind of just check out, space out, and suddenly you go away. There's no more you left when there's TV to watch. Um, Vajra, sharp clarity. So what drug or drugs do people use for that? What drugs do we do to develop insight? Psychedelics, LSD. Some people might use cocaine or stimulants actually in certain moments too. Not the active part of that, but sort of the, the clarity part of that. And internet surfing, like the addiction of internet surfing could be that too. All the knowledge that you get to gain and, and just like all the things that are happening, all the details. And then Ratna. Um, what drug um, kind of brings us into kind of like pure joy and enjoyment of life? Ah. Oh. It's the opioids, the opioids, the opiums, heroin, kratom. Alcohol, too, I think, is this one. Alcohol. Alcohol might be all of them, but um, alcohol, this one. And then here we might find shopping addictions as a rotten energy. You know, online shopping on Amazon or going shopping. And then food addictions. Consumption and, and just the overindulging in pleasure. And then Padma. So what drug, what's the, what are the love drugs? <laughs> you know, what makes us want to just get right in there with another person and, and have some fun. So our MDMA, our ecstasies, as well as sex and porn addictions could be in there. And then karma, which ones give us energy? Cocaine, meth, amphetamines, caffeine, nicotine, energy drinks. And then there's exercise addictions and multitasking addictions, like just multitasking can kind of be its own compulsive behavior. Um, you know, checking things off the box or checking the boxes off a list. And then workaholics. So each energy... I find that really interesting, actually, and that's a way I think we can see into our energies a little, as uh, a little more clearly as well. So, in concluding, I'd just like to remind us that we all carry all of these energies, and they're happening all day. You know, um, we do have our primaries, but we're using each of these wisdoms throughout the days of our lives to make our lives happen. Um, labeling ourselves can be limiting. It can also be freeing. You know, as a therapist, it's my role to give people diagnoses. And it's my duty to try to get them as right as I can. Um, and some people, uh, they just really don't like those labels. And I get it. They feel boxed in, minimized. Also, it's it's kind of like too much of a reflection sometimes. It's too that mirror like wisdom there is too much. They don't want to see what they're dealing with. They don't want to deal with it. Um, other times, and I will say that this is actually more the common, more common um, from what I see in the roles that I play, is that people are really grateful to finally be given some kind of explanation of what they've been dealing with for the last 30 years. Because uh, they've been swirling around in a chaos of confusion trying to do this self-help thing or that 
meditation or this thing or that thing or this drug or that medication and they went to see this chiropractor or that you know and finally if you get the diagnosis right it can be this thing that can be so incredibly helpful and i've seen people just start bawling because they finally felt seen and they and they and they realize that because there's a diagnosis that means millions of other people are also experiencing the same thing that they're experiencing. So they finally realize that they're not alone in it. So in a similar way, these energies can be helpful in that way. Um, for me, it was helpful to, it was both painful and helpful to see that I was a karma energy, that that's one of my primary energies. Um, and I'll say that like sort of my ideals, like, oh, everybody should be Buddha Padma. That's, that's the ideal, Buddha Padma. That's what everybody should be. But really, those are my opposites, my natural opposites, and those were the ones that, that were my shadows, my disowned parts, or the parts that I hadn't developed enough, or that, you know, were just, um, you know, however my conditioning and my genetics were set up in this life, they were the ones that were the least available to me. And... Um, and so we can get caught in that, but then just recognizing, okay, these are my strengths and I, and I can, and I can accept that. And then, so for me, I've done all of those techniques of working with the energies of balancing, strengthening, um, yeah. So anyway, thank you again. This is the conclusion of my seven talks. And I want to thank the Roshis for giving me this challenge and this opportunity. It's been a, um, a wonderful exploration for me on a personal level. And I feel like energies have opened up for me. Balancing has happened. Um, new insights have, have happened through this process. Uh, and then it's also given me an opportunity to, to share information that within our Sangha, that it's a language that I use quite a bit in other venues but haven't been able to use in this venue because it hasn't been something that we've talked about here much. Um, so now, you know, it is a language that we can use if we want to. And um, I find that in using the language, like, oh, you know, that's my karma energy showing up or that's my, that's my Vajra, you know, um, getting a little tight there. Um, that little statement can say a lot, you know, that normally I might have to say, you know, go into a long soliloquy about to try to explain what's going on, but it's, it can be, um, disarming and connecting to actually be able to chat with each other and know what we're talking about. Um, and then, um, be able to forgive each other and then also support each other in our processes of, of unfolding in, in, in natural ways and, and, and being more expansive and less constricted. So.